Hello and welcome again to The Imperfect Clinician. My name is Mike Grudzinski, and in episode 3, Ewan will give us insight to her childhood and upbringing, and discuss how these affect her current journey, so we can understand better where she is now. Some of it will be personal, but we promise to be raw and open. Everyone has their own story. Find time to reflect on your own baggage from your early years, return to how you were, and see the connections to how you are now. Enjoy. Hello and thank you for joining us for episode three of The Imperfect Clinician. My name is Mike Grudzinski and I'm here with Ewan is here with me as well. And this week uh, we want to talk, uh, we want to take it be- to the time we were before the episode two. So in episode two, we were discussing where we are now as people and as clinicians. And now we want to look at how we got here. So we're going to try to unpack our baggage. Uh, we all have some histories that formed uh, us uh, to the shape we are currently in. Um, we all have childhood, upbringing, and all the little bits of our lives that brought us where we are here. So we want to be honest. We want to show you that we are also vulnerable and we want to learn um, ourselves and grow with you. It's a journey, so uh, to make sure you pack the right things with you, first you have to make sure that you unpack your baggage. Otherwise, you will struggle to try anything new because all this space is going to be already preoccupied. Okay, Ewan, tell me your story. What would you like to know? Well, start from the beginning. So, What childhood, like you said? Yeah, what are you like as a child? How you got here? Yeah. I was nerdy as a child. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So I really liked books. And that has always been something that has been praised. So my hobby has been praised. Um, And then when I was growing up, same again, nerdy. I think cultural and expectation sort of formed that. And to give you some context, I'm I'm from Malaysia. And so growing up in an Asian culture, the competitiveness, the comparison, that's always been something that I grew up with. And then I went to uni in in the UK. I moved to the UK, studied here, and then stayed here ever since. Okay. And what was your daily life what were you worried about when you were a child what were you happy about Um, how how was it for you so um, it might sound a bit sad but I think when I'm happy it's when I got good grades (laughs) okay but this is something that's um um enforced by the cultural and bringing would you say Culture and family, I want to say, because my mom's a teacher. Okay, so, <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> so she's a teacher in the same school. Um, and so if I don't score well, another teacher will, before even telling me, will go and tell my mom, oh, I don't think your daughter did very well. Oh, there's pressure. Yeah. So, so then, so for me... Why does it make it happy? Because I have less to deal with. I have less disappointment to deal with. I have less, why did you not do better to deal with? And so I think a lot of my upbringing now reflecting upon it feels very performative. 
so I have to perform result wise from the academic perspective I have to be good in extracurricular because it will look good on paper so it will perform better on paper it's always been the result the outcome not not the importance of the process okay what made you upset when you were a child what made me upset so i think what made me upset initially when i couldn't reach parents expectation and that slowly parent and society's expectation then automatically be became my own expectation i almost didn't need somebody else to tell me how i should perform because i've seen and heard it so many times it became my own standard okay and so you were a nerd as a child and now are you still a nerd um <laughs> um to some extent i think yeah i i still like to do things i have specific things that i like to do specific things that brings me joy but i think i approach things i consciously make an effort not to make it performative so an example of um i was i was asked to play the piano and when i didn't like it i was forced to continue and then when i got to a higher grade i just went i don't want to do it anymore and i wasn't given that choice so I, then i said well i'm coming to nottingham so i can't do it <laughs> <laughs> so then i took that option out and because of that the the trauma of being forced to continue with something that I didn't like um I didn't touch the piano for 10 years after that and then what changed what changed um I wanted to in a way rebuild my relationship with the piano I didn't want the relationship to be built upon expectation the performance the ticking box exercise but was it the love for the piano or was it the feeling that you didn't want to let your knowledge and ability to play go away mm, i think it's my love for being creative with music Okay. And my outlet was piano. So I wanted to approach piano in the sense of I am going to play it, but there is no restrictions. If I don't play it, there is no guilt. And if I like it, I will play as long as I, or as short as I like. I get to have a say. I get to have a sense of control over it. And how does it make you feel? Does it uh, make you feel empowered? Does it make you feel relieved? What's 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 the first feeling that comes to mind when you came back to playing piano? Um, I want to say relief first, then empowered, because I was relieved that I didn't let that trauma shadow my experience with music and then it allowed me to be creative to explore to be adventurous to be silly with the piano and i think the one of the driver is i wanted to show the kids that you can enjoy the instrument and take it at your own pace do it whenever you like to and i almost like made a vow to myself not to enforce the same things on the children well I'm, i have slightly different relationship with uh, with music and with instruments not probably as target driven but first i want to ask you how your childhood 
and your target driven performance rating and all the um, things that you had to fulfill to meet the expectations, whether they were yours or parents or society, it's, it's a bit less relevant. How did it prepare you for a journey as a clinician? So back to your, I'll answer the first bit of the, not the question, but the, the point that you said. So you mentioned about your relationship with the instrument. And I think seeing your enthusiasm, your pure bliss and joy on the guitar and your ability to just be spontaneous and make mistakes and play something and be right or wrong it all doesn't matter that was so liberating for me to watch and I think that really helped me understand that you can be free just by letting that mindset go and so that was a that was a great model for me to see that in you because you modeled that to the children you modeled that to me and so I learned from that because I couldn't learn it in the society that I grew up with so yeah back to your question about how did that childhood of the performance affected my work now you said, and affected me as a clinician. So I want to say it's prepared me to some extent because a lot of the education system that we have got, regardless of which country you are, will be performance rating, study and work. And so when you're used to that system, it's you go, all right, it's the same system. So I just, I know how to go about it. But then the driver changes. So for me, when I do it for that performance, for that, for people to say, you are so good at what you're doing, you are such a good clinician, that becomes how I see myself. And if I have a bad day or if somebody said something as a patient or as a colleague or the clinician, I will start to doubt myself. So then I think the performance wise worked to some extent, but it did not give me the resilience to bounce back from a bad day. But now uh, going th back to the analogy with, uh, with the instrument, you became a quite fulfilled clinician, I want to say, and you still want to do more and you're quite involved in what you're doing. And have you had that liberating moment or was it a process in... Uh, we, I'm trying to find some analogy between what you come across, the role model or the set of values that might have appeared all of a sudden during a longer process to take you where you are now? It's definitely say it's a long, it has been a long process ever since, even before I started working. Every time I'm in a work environment, whether it's a placement, it's always been I need to perform because whether I was working in my dad's friend's company, so my performance will be rated and then informed back to my parents. And then when I'm then older, it, that becomes what I'm try, trying to do. So I think what I'm trying to be, it's relatively similar, but the why behind those reasons have changed throughout the years. So the why behind the past is if I don't achieve this standard that I set for myself, then I am not a good enough clinician. I'm not a good enough person. So it almost inform my identity. And because it's so fear-driven, my reaction to my surrounding 
the stress, um, the expectation, I was quite brittle. I think that's the only word I can think opposite of resilience as a person. It was quite rigid. Things have to be in a certain way because I was so driven by insecurities and fears. And now I, I still want to be a better clinician. It's one of the purpose why I'm doing this with you. But I am doing it for a different purpose, a different intention altogether. I'm doing it so that I can help myself and the people around me, all the listeners, to grow collectively. And I want to use all the effort that I've put in reading, writing, or the background work that I've put in to share the knowledge, share the journey so people can tap into what I've learned and hopefully relate to what they've experienced in themselves and perhaps have a quicker progression or uh, an earlier awareness of it so they can work on it because pre- before I got into this clear purpose and intention, it was quite tiring. It's almost like a what we mentioned before about scarcity mindset. So it's like you and I lose zero sub perspective. So then if I share too much, what's going to happen? How is it going to affect me? And if somebody else is better, how do I take it personally? Whereas now, anyone's growth around me for me, reflects the growth for the profession. So myself, I've put myself out of the equation because it's not the egos in the driving seat. Not that, not that it's very easy. I have to, have to be very mindful not to let ego into the driving seat. And because uh, we're talking about unpacking the baggage. Uh, that we carry with us. Mm. How does your childhood or bringing prepare you to where you are now? Or I will flip the question and I will ask you, would you have been in the same position should you not, not go through all your childhood and upbringing? Just fantasize and tell me what would have happened if that did not take place if you were on a different route what were you doing if the conditions were optimal or if they were worse i think choose the path that's why i'm trying to create a different environment for the children where it's not the performance it's the development that's important it's how you feel it's important your voice is being heard regardless of your age you are a part of the family that is important. So your presence and you as a person is good, is great, regardless of what you have done. So your behavior doesn't define you. Your behavior shows that this is a, this is a strength or this is an area that we need to work on together. And it doesn't... It's not, you've done something wrong equals you're a bad person. Instead of, I've done something and you go, I'm stupid. Or, I'm stupid for doing this thing. It's a two different way of speaking to yourself. Very true. In the previous episode, we were talking about inventory, about Brene's Brown inventory and the results that we have achieved there. Uh, so tell me how this results that you got, or the, let's talk about the bottom two characteristics you could do with improving or working on. Where did your childhood and your upbringing, how did it got you to that point? So... I want to say to all the listeners, it can be your bottom two. It doesn't have to be. It can be any two areas. 
for me, these two areas really relate to me in terms of my own personal growth. So last week I talked about perfectionism. So um, in Brene Brown's book, The Gifts of Imperfection and Atlas of the Heart, and a lot, you've probably heard it so many times, even in her, in her TED talk, perfectionism, um, what birthed perfectionism? It's shame, shame culture. So what I talked about earlier on, I am stupid, it's shame. I did a stupid thing, it's guilt. So you let it define you as a person, that's shame. So I grew up in a culture, I didn't know the language then, but I grew up in a culture where it's very normal to be shamed. I'll give you an example that I, I remember quite vividly. So I had a period of rebelliousness. And for me, rebelliousness, some people might scoff and think that is rebellious. For me, it's not studying. And that's a big thing in the house, a big thing. So then after trying everything, threats, what my parents did was they drove me to look at um, homeless people. And because in our country, it's a different benefit system. You will see quite a lot of homeless people on the street. And they would say to me, if you don't get good results, you will end up like this and your life would be worthless. That's a shock therapy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so that is shame. It doesn't say you didn't put enough effort in. It says you, your worth is the same as your result that, come, that came across that way to me. I'm sure they meant well. I've got to the point now where I can accept where they're coming from because I want to think that is driven by their fear as well. Fear fear. And everybody not. wants, you know, good things for their children. Everybody wants them to uh, be successful and to have easier life. It's just yes, the and road to it. Perhaps also that, that also comes from what if people don't think I'm a good enough parent? And so they want to use any way that they know. And it might be the these are the only way that they know because it's an environment that they grew up with. And that's the surroundings, uh, you know. Yeah. It's, you said it's a part of society as yeah. well. So those are not great actions. Those are shaming actions, but they are good parents. So no, what I'm trying to do is not to shame, not to start the shame cycle again, or I'm consciously trying to break that shame cycle. Uh, it's still a work in progress because it's so easy to fall into that because it's it's easy to say it it's so easy to blame and to resent and say something like this without realizing the impact that you have on the other person because you have to reconcile it not only you know shame or or uh, find the guilt or blame it's just how you reconcile it in your head that's what's most important here i think I think I disagree. I think most importantly is for you to understand what's the difference because people use shame, guilt, resentment, blame interchangeably and it's not the same. And when you're able to differentiate it, you have the awareness to reflect on how you, first of all, most importantly, how you speak to yourself and second of all, how you speak to other people around you because when are we most critical to others or to ourselves? For me, it's definitely myself. To yourself, yeah, yeah. To yourself. So then, when you've been mindful about that, I can then know when I am shaming myself. And so I can learn and practice. It has to come from practice because I've grew up listening to these voices for what, 20 years? easy and so this becomes my neural pathway that's very very strong and this becomes my default pathway 
So what I'm trying to do is unlearn and build a new one. And like all new habits that you're trying to incorporate, it's difficult. It takes effort. It takes consistency for you to get there. So, yeah, it's something that I'm trying to work on. And and I know where it's coming from. So I am conscious that I'm doing everything that I can. I think for me, the most liberating thing is for me to find out where it came from. And then I can work on dismantling it. Because when I know why, then I can reflect on, well, it's not actually me. It's actually brought on by these environment that I had no resilience against. But now when I know about it, I can then work on it. So for perfectionism this is something that i'm trying to do okay so perfectionism was uh, the f- the first one and the second one which in my opinion can link in with that was the exhaustion as a status symbol because perfectionism can be quite tiring extremely and, <laughs> and that can lead to exhaustion so how do you work on that how do you think your upbringing um, got you to the point that you say, well, I'm exhausted, in the meaning uh, that Brene Brown considers? So before we move on to the next point, what I'm trying to, the purpose behind unpacking all of this is first of all to have the awareness and second of all to have the tool to cultivate new ways of talking to myself so I'm trying to practice self-compassion because what am I being perfect for because of the judgment or am I being perfect because I'm trying to escape from judgment am I being perfect because I don't want to feel inadequate um am I being perfect because I don't want to feel less than. So it might be all three sometimes. And so I have to practice this mantra that I've got that I say to myself and to my team as well is I am good enough. I'm good enough as a person. I can have a really crappy day. But I am still a good learning clinician. It does not reflect my ability as a person. Same as a mom. It can be a very hard day with the children. But I had a hard day as a mom. It doesn't mean I'm a bad mom. So yeah, um, when you talk about the exhaustion, a status symbol and productivity of self-worth. That is a revelation to me. (laughs) Okay, Um, tell me more. It shouldn't be, but it was because it became so entrenched in me that I didn't even notice. So what I meant by that is I have been surrounded by women around me that would push themselves to the absolute brink of an, of exhaustion and that is something to celebrate if you stretch yourself so thin it's great it's you are not celebrated by having boundaries you're not celebrated by having the courage to say I need some time for self-care I grew up in a culture where we celebrate people who can do everything perfectly so perfect the image of a perfect roles all the roles that they hold 
whatever job, mum, daughter, daughter-in-law, all of that. And by doing, by keeping this status, just by the upkeep of it, it stretched them so thin to the level of it's affecting their mental health or it, it's causing so much anxiety. But it is seen as not just okay, but something that should be revered. And I saw it and I just took it as it is face value because that was all you knew that's all I knew exactly and it wasn't until I started to question things that I got a lot of mm, denial <laughs> opposition opposition definitely arguments debate that you are wrong because you are young or you wouldn't know until you get to our age or um yeah that that is not a constructive discussion and then so this slowly became because i couldn't find something for me to sort of compare against that became what i knew as norm so then I would push myself until I'm just stretched so thin, saying no, it's so difficult because then it's a reflection of what if I'm not good enough? What if I'm perceived as not good enough? What if I'm not perfect? Back to the perfectionism. It's all interlinked, frustratingly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. And perfectionism f for me is like a precursor of um exhaustion yes because it has to lead to it and um, it it comes out it's like a consequence of being perfect in a way mm. because you're trying to fulfill all your uh, quite strict uh, criteria or whatever the um, targets you have set for yourself or others have set mm. um mainly yourself because otherwise you would not be a perfectionist yeah, yeah. This is why we are here amongst the imperfect clinicians. Because we all are imperfect. <laughs> yes, we are all. And I don't know, speak to any clinician, speak to any clinician and see how they are work-wise, home-wise, the balance, the time that they're scheduling for self-care. Ask any parents who are clinicians as well and how they have strict boundaries or none at all about that because what we do is we put other people as priority as clinicians we put patients as priority as parents we put children as priority as daughters sons we put parents as priority and in that list we're not there there isn't any time for ourselves there isn't and you're right and this is why we like our little girls to and not only love others, but also love themselves. Yes. It was, it was, I was trying to get them to practice saying, I love me. And it was so odd at the start because I've never, I've never heard it before. But for them to say, yes, I love me. And the confidence that comes out of it, it's just, it just shows, hopefully it helps them. <laughs> We'll see. <laughs> Join us in 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So what, I, what I'm what i trying to do, and this is, I, I get feedback from Mike a lot, is you don't rest, you don't play. What, what did you say? Or, or what are your thoughts around my rest and play? I consider probably the definition of play is different for us. Yes. I think that it's quite important. And to be fair, I think I had the bit of a luxury of being able to find time where I can stare at the ceiling. That's the just a, a saying of time for myself, that you Doing have time thing. to be with your thoughts, to have time to, well, reflect, plan, do whatever you want without being um, restricted. 
I think everybody needs to be able to find that time. That's my meditation time. That, that's your meditation time. And it, it might have many different forms, and it is quite a um, broad idea because different things work for different people. I find staring at the ceiling, or some people do breathing exercises, some people do all sorts of different activities, gaming. Oh my goodness, that's what I used to do for quite a bit. Then it stopped when I had children. Um, also, you know, scrolling your phone or whatever, but, but this is something that doesn't help you come to peace with yourself. We'll go to that part because that's yeah, your that, part that's, to say. But I, I want to I want to delve into what you think about my version of rest and my version of how does your version of play differ from my version of play? Because you you talk about staring into space or just be with your thoughts, and I get that that is the importance of. But you do it in a form of meditation. I, I do it in form of meditation. But that's not play. Okay, so your what about your version of play, and how is it different from mine? Uh, well, play is something that allows you to put your mind in a completely different position to relax it. It could be done through a book, it could be done through running, whatever, going on a bike, watching a movie that you wouldn't watch otherwise. I don't know, we don't have a lot of time to watch anything, <laughs> but occasionally we do try to see something that would be completely unrelated to what we like, to what we know. I think it's it's a good idea because then you need to focus your brain muscles <laughs> on a completely different, you're flexing different brain muscles on an activity that brings you joy and nothing else. There may not be anything more in it. So I think it is quite important to find a bit of time to celebrate your enjoyment. And you mentioned about being spontaneous as well. Yeah, well, yes. It, it comes with uh, the fact that, right, what, we, how, what are we playing? We don't know. Let's just make up something that we're going to enjoy. If you schedule something, if you plan something ahead, then you know what to expect. And it doesn't become um, very often, it may not be what you were hoping for at this particular moment, yeah. but because you planned it, you carried on with it. And I sometimes say, right, I've got some time. Why don't I do X, Y, and Z? And this is where I think that it allows me to, in this particular moment, in statu nascendi, <laughs> enjoy, <Does that> <laughs> in, at the moment of creation, you, you realize what you uh, would like to do. I said, right, I've got some time. I want to go on a bike. I want to read a book. I want a glass of wine. Whatever the play is. I think our, I feel our biggest disagreement about play is purpose. <laughs> so, so I, I like things. I want, I like to do things for a reason because if I don't, it really frustrates me. And, and it might go back to my, you, how I You look see, at it as wasting time. Yeah. And it goes back to that part where productivity is self-worth. It might be some of that. And it might be some things I would really like to do that I want to plan in. And Mike's version of play is purposeless, where he'll just go, but why do you need a purpose? Just do it. And <laughs> Not everything in life, in my opinion, has to have a purpose. And I think that we often can have a better perspective on the things that uh, matter to us, that we need to really, truly focus on, if we step away from it. If we step away from the focus that our brains got to commit to, to get somewhere. So if you are focused on work, if you are focused on family, uh, whatever activities you have to do, and there is like a logical, you know, things in your daily, weekly, or monthly cycle, and you 
relax by focusing even more on things that you are going to learn, get better at, and read books that are going to develop you as a person, then where is time for your brain to say, all right, now I have to take it easy and just it's not medi- think. This is my meditation. Well, you see, maybe this is your play. Maybe, maybe, maybe this is your play. Yeah, maybe you're right. I am. I, it's still work in progress for me, I have to say. I think for everything and perhaps for all of us, it's always going to be work in progress. Well, I think that with the, when it comes to play, I think I'm going a little bit backwards. I don't think I can find enough time often to just be purposeless. There is so many things that I have to do and want to do and that I would like to do but never have a chance to catch up on that I struggle to find this time for myself to do something purposeless or without thinking or spontaneous. And this With young kids it, it is quite hard I feel to have... When we retire. When we retire. <laughs> But I feel having scheduling things for your play has been helpful. So Mike's really into biking at the moment. You can tell them a bit about how that has, how we schedule it in and how, how did it make you feel? When I did my inventory, one of the things that uh, came up was uh, numbing, and the other one was anxiety as a oh, lifestyle. Oh, are you going that way? Yeah, 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 to... I, I, yeah. But this is this okay. is in a way related to it. Okay. Because anxiety as a lifestyle, when we consider that part of uh, that uh, inventory, and because that's where I sort of looked at it in a slightly different way, and led me to doing things slightly differently was that I like to have things as a part of routine because that's the routine I can easily defend. It's my defense mode and I feel happy when I'm, uh, I've got everything sorted and everything is always done and I feel safe. So now, and it comes, to, it comes from uh, the fact that I needed to have a clear head to do other things that I really, really wanted to do So let's say we are recording this episode of podcast, okay? I needed to make sure that all the things are done in the house so that I can have clear mind, so I can sit down and relax and truly enjoy what we're doing, that we're talking to you guys, that we're talking to each other, discussing things, and I can really focus on there's nothing on the back of the mind. It's a precursor to it. Yeah, but... That, unfortunately, leads to the fact that you have very little time to do those things that you really, really want. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because if you don't schedule it in, it appears that you never have time to do it. So we found some time. And now, twice a week, I get a chance to hop on a bike and go for an hour, do whatever I like on a bike, just for fun, nothing else. Otherwise... I wasn't able to do it. So scheduling that, well, let's put it down into exercise and not a true play because it's scheduled and I don't treat it as a spontaneous thing. Well, it is play, but it's not something that comes out of... I'd say it's a hybrid. It's a a hybrid. It's It's a very, very good compromise. I mean, I love biking lately. I came back to biking after many, many years and I thought that because our little girls are starting to bike and uh, if none of us were really doing it with them, they would have dumped it after a couple of years because there wouldn't be a culture of it. What you said about the having instruments at home, that the girls can see that it brings you joy that you sit in front of a piano to make yourself happy and then see you smiling. You're not stressed in the environment. And that's why we have, you know, Guitars, ukuleles, and uh, other instruments in the we house. Have jamming sessions. And we have jamming session with the girls. <laughs> <laughs> we just do. Not as posh as what you would see in the music videos, but just kids strumming on guitar without any chords, and we're all singing together and out of tune, and we're just having first, loads of fun. First the joy, and then uh, the skill. Yeah, that's that's yes. how things start through passion, rather than first you learn the skill. 
and then you lose the joy. That's what you did for many yes, years. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, but you came back to it. So was it all that bad? <laughs> um, I would prefer your way. <laughs> but I perhaps, would prefer my way. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, okay. So that was my story. It's, it's a lot. Well, it wasn't the full story. You, you're not 18. <laughs> yes, and I think it's something for us to relate to because in part two of this, we'll talk about Mike's story. He's talked a little about his anxiety as his lifestyle, but we'll delve deeper into his childhood, his upbringing, and what is contributing to his anxiety as a lifestyle and numbing I think the other one for you is yep. so we hope you can relate to my story today it's it's not easy for me to share all of this because it's it's hard it's I've always wanted to I don't know kept it aside because it's not something that I'm proud of but I've come to the point where hopefully when I'm able to share my pain people can realize that they're not alone and realize that we're all in this together so we hope you're able to relate reflect and rise thank you for listening and thank you for your time it's been Ewan and Mike, and you have been listening to the Imperfect Clinician podcast. You can follow the Imperfect Clinician on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. You will find all the information about our episodes on our website, theimperfectclinician.com, where you can join the discussion by leaving us a voicemail or comment. If you haven't yet, please subscribe, rate, and review our podcast wherever you listen to it. Recommend the podcast to one person that will benefit from it. Join us next week for another conversation. Thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>